So, okay. So I kind of just threw a quick, a few quick slides together um, on a lot of troubleshooting uh, scenarios. So basically, the the common cases that we get. So I'll kind of walk through, um, you know, those those main issues. Um, so first is if the ENOB is inactive. Uh, I kind of wrote what processes to follow. We kind of covered that when we looked at the main page before. But the very first thing you want to check, obviously, is is the IPsec disconnected? <laughs> um, if it's disconnected, then uh, you need to make sure you're, that you're, you have a route out to the internet, of course, with the, that interface. Um, you want to make sure that the tunnel itself is enabled. Um, and you want to make sure from the IPsec page um, that the gateway is set to this address. Um, now, like I mentioned before, we had a an issue where some of the ENOBs pre-November that were shipped out, um, they did not have the right address. So, <laughs> Actually, before we hit to troubleshooting, um, let's go ahead and take our break because troubleshooting could prompt you know, more Q&A and stuff That's like fine. that, and I don't want to rush through that part. So yeah. let's do a 15-minute uh, break, if you will, and please try to jump on back in here promptly. Okay. So 11, 11.25, yeah. back. It's 11. Oh, <laughs> All right, so let's continue with uh, this scenario here. So we basically discussed uh, making sure IPsec is connected. Um, and like I mentioned, there might be an issue with the configuration. So if it's out of the box, you just opened it, um, this is good to note for the first item. Uh, second, if it is connected, but MME is disconnected, the first thing is maybe just wait, <laughs> especially if you just powered it on, because it can take, uh, sometimes it can take a few minutes uh, for the MME connection to take place. Um, if for some reason that MME IP changed, you'll want to make sure you change it back. 10304, that's the IP of the, the MME um, over the IPsec tunnel. Um, <clears throat> the other thing we found, and this is kind of also related to potentially a wrong config, is you'll notice when you buy new enodebs that this, the cell ID that comes with it is kind of a long it, it seems random number, but there's a, a calculation to it. Um, we base that, uh, I believe, off the MAC address um, of the E node B. So each uh, E node B should have a unique cell ID. But if there's a confliction, um, we found that uh, some with the wrong config were set to 50, and then maybe someone else has an E node B set to 50, so they're flapping, you know, um, they're fighting each other for the MME connection. Um, so these are things to note if the MME is not connecting. Um, one thing I didn't write on here is the other thing it could be is GPS isn't syncing. Um, so if you uh, have the GPS antenna uh, plugged in, it will actually um, synchronize first before becoming active. But I believe the MME should be connected even during that phase. But um, I already mentioned this before. <laughs> uh, I'd recommend not using VLANs right now. Um, we found an issue with that um, that can cause issues uh, with the APC connection. Yeah, we we yeah. send a, every Friday without fail. We, we've done one since I guess it was started these in June. So uh, you can sign up for that newsletter um, also uh, we have it a link from the Facebook page. We have a link from the bottom of the web. Actually, you open up the website. It's staring at you right there in your face. So, because we want people to uh, to get those regular updates, and that's where Jesse posts um, technical stuff. So, when this thing is fixed, for example, uh, we'll make sure that message gets out there. Okay. All right. So, if the ENOB is active, but the CPE uh, or the CPE is actually attached. Um, but there's no user traffic. Um, I've ran into you know this a few times uh, with customer support issues. 
Um, first of all, like I mentioned, you want to make sure LGW is enabled. If for whatever reason that got disabled, um, our cloud core will actually drop all the user traffic. Um, if you have router mode, <laughs> a lot of people will switch to router mode, but either not know or forget to add static routes on their network to be able to route to that network. So of course you want to make sure that that network that you set in router mode, the subnet facing the clients, that is, it is routable. Um, if bridge mode is being used, you just want to make sure that the DHCP server is on that network. Um, we do have the fourth item is an issue we found kind of recently where a CPE might suddenly lose its gateway, but it, it usually happens if the CPE drops, uh, disconnects, and then reconnects. Um, there's a chance that the default gateway will not uh, be received. So in this case, the CPE appears to be attached, um, but it just isn't passing any, any traffic, and usually the, su the subscriber would have to power cycle it to bring it back. Um, I posted a link here on the Keep Alive page. Uh, this is where you can do a uh, kind of a ping watchdog type feature where you can set, you know, to ping a certain IP address. Um, so this would be a temporary solution if this is a problem that you guys have experienced. Uh, we are implementing a full ping watchdog feature in, in later software. Is the, I, this will work, Keep Alive works, but <laughs> the issue is you can't set the interval, so it's always going to be one second um, is the only issue with that. So basically every second it will ping, um, and after so many timeouts that you specify, it would just reboot the CPE. So that would, like I said, re temporarily resolve the, the losing gateway issue. It, just to uh, go on the keep alive thing, as far as LT resourcing is concerned, use it if you need to, but don't get in the habit of setting a keep alive interval of one second for your entire network. That really messes up with your air utilization time and how much capacity your cell is going to take, because essentially that means your UEs are constantly transmitting. Uh, to, to get a response, so it's overall it will have a negative impact on your network at one second. So use it for those customers as a workaround that yeah. you absolutely need to. Correct. So, yeah, in LTE, uh, when we talked a little bit about scheduling earlier, only so many UEs can be scheduled at one time. So if you have lots of UEs doing management traffic, you know, it will, it will affect the aggregate throughput. Okay, uh, this we kind of touched on with uh, if the CPE or Eno B is not listed in the OMC. Um, first, you want to make sure um, that you onboarded it on the device page. We walked through that on an earlier slide. Um, it does not automatically add itself. Um, if, if at that point you verified that the serial number or MAC address was entered correctly, and it's connected, but it just doesn't show online on the OMC, um, at that point, it could be uh, a DNS issue. So if there's no DNS server uh, assigned or just doesn't work, um, that would be an issue. The other is I listed the, um, it, the TR69 uh, ACS parameter, um, and this is what you'd want to enter into the CPE. So. Just check the TR69 settings, make sure that that's in there. If for whatever reason that changed, um, then that might be a reason. Um, there's also, the eNodeB has this parameter as well. It's called the management IP server. Um, and then lastly, I ran into this once with one operator where they were blocking outbound ports. So you'll just want to make sure that that port, if you are doing firewall rules for outbound, make sure to allow that port out. Um, so if the CPE does not fully attach, so um, if, if the CPE, you can see the signal, it's receiving signal, but it just never connects. Um, we talked about this earlier too, just make sure the, the MZ is activated. So that's on the boss subscriber page. So if that, if, you, if that got forgotten to be added, then it just won't attach because it cannot authenticate to the network. Um, USIM status, you want to make sure it says ready. Um, if there's an issue with the slot or SIM card itself, it may say USIM not ready. Um, 
you want to make sure, of course, the ENOB is active uh, so that the RF is turned on. Um, another issue you may have is you could be at a pretty far distance and you would the, you could still measure the actual signal. So if you're at, say, 20 miles, you might see the signal. It might show you, you know, some of the metrics, but it won't actually uh, attach. And that's due to some of the parameters limiting the distance. Um, so I listed here uh, is a kind of a screenshot in the corner there um, of one of the parameters you can adjust. Um, to increase uh, the distance from 10 kilometers to 14 kilometers. So, so you got better performance out of 11. Yeah. Um, I mean, when you increase distance with parameters, I mean, in Theoretically, it will affect the throughput, but I don't think it should affect it that much. Um, okay, that, that's a good note. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll discuss that with the team then, because that's the first time I've what heard What size that. channel are you running? Okay. Yeah. So, but you were able to prove that by changing it to 11 or 10? Okay, it might be a bug then, so that's, that's a good, good thing to know. Thank you. Um, if there's something wrong with the ENOB itself, uh, whether it reached a bug or for whatever issue, you know, the next recourse would be to reboot the ENOB, uh, see if that allows the CPU to reconnect. If it does, then I would probably ask that you send us a support request. That way we could review your logs to find out why you need to reboot, because that shouldn't be the normal behavior. Um, and then lastly, if there's heavy interference or heavy path loss, that would also affect the UE from maybe seeing signal, but not actually being able to attach. All right, so when we're troubleshooting LTE networks, the, the main kind of uh, metric I look for, um, since we don't really have a spectrum analyzer, the best way to try to help determine interference uh, is with blur. So if, you're, if you remember, uh, in some earlier slides, we talked about HARC briefly, where it sends you the acknowledgement messages and non-acknowledgement. So we just take that calculation um, to determine what is the percentage uh, of unacknowledged messages. So, and then the other thing, if you remember, the target is 10%. In LTE, the, the specs are designed for it to be under 10. So as you can see with this example here, um, there's definitely spikes that are over 10. Now, Randa, you know, it will occasionally spike but um, anything spikes, you know, for a consistent time over 10, it, it will, there's a chance that the UEs will disconnect. Um, so in this, you can see that there's kind of a burst of interference uh, on the downlink and uplink at a particular point. Um, and uh, for this particular customer, this is a report I was running off there, you know, be when troubleshooting interference. So. Um, so one of the issues right now is to get this report, um, it's through the syslog. So I kind of just parse the syslog to generate this. Um, we will have KPIs in the near future, so from the OMC, um, that you could also view these kind of metrics. And uh, I'm also planning to implement a, a program you can upload your syslog to and it would generate all these for you. Um, and then, of course, you'll have, uh, in the future, we'll have SNMP so that you can monitor uh, these as well. Okay. So, yeah, so other than, you know, so when we're talking about interference, the other thing to note is interference isn't just due to, you know, RF. It can be due to the PCI collisions, uh, which Cameron will discuss later and it can also be due to high PIM. 
So in LTE, PIM is uh, very, <laughs> uh, it's very sensitive to PIM. So when you're selecting your coax cables, you know, you want to generally select something that's, you know, truly low PIM grade. Um, so they do have special cables, you know, almost designed just for LTE in a sense, um, as, you know, just any kind of PIMs within the cabling um, can cause issues like spikes, you know, so that potentially this could be even PIM related. How many people, just by a quick show of hands, use an LMR 400? You're probably going to have a problem at some point. <laughs> we were preferably some sort of half inch heliax, yes, cables like that with low PIM connectors. Um, we're going to be working with some of our distributors uh, to talk about some of the cables we recommend, but be on the lookout for a, a low PIM connector. And they also have pre pimmed cables that you can buy. Come again? Superflex would work, yes. Well, typically, more often than not, I'm going to guess by the same show of hands, you probably make your own LMR jumpers. Um, if, again, if you guys wouldn't mind, just put your hands up here if you're making your own LMR 400 jumpers. Um, I, I'm victim of this as well. So I make my own cables, and I had been for a long time before I switched to a Heliax or Superflex. Is it's almost impossible, at least with the easy 400 connectors, to have a cable that you make that will pass a PIM test. It's, it's just uh, inevitable. And it's really sensitive in the LT modulation schemes that you know, the cable is going to pass just about every sweep test you put on, and it's going to look great. But if you put it on a PIM test, it will fail uh, nearly eight, eight to nine times out of ten. It was, it was almost remarkable. I didn't believe it until I started seeing some issues on my own, uh, and I kind of learned the hard way that uh, you know, trying to just buy a big 1,000-foot reel of uh, you know, whatever the flavor of the month was for LMR 400 and doing my own, but uh, I made, it made a big difference switching to low PIM cables and that, that came pre pim and particularly a, a Superflex or a Heliax type of cable. There's some other technical uh, descriptions in it as to why, but uh, I won't get into that right at the moment. Right. Yeah, and you just gotta be careful because <laughs> LMR 400s, they'll market it as low pim Just be careful of that. <laughs> so what do you recommend? Uh, uh, Sure, sure. I'm, I'm comfortable with like a Superflex or a Heliax type cable. Uh, I don't know, uh, w as far as distributors, I don't know if Dennis, uh, you know, if you're carrying a low PIM type of cable in stock, if you are, of course he is. Dennis and Linktex, they're also here, so yeah. yes. I feel humbled by being in the presence of a microtech god. <laughs> yes, sir. Charge us the extra money to throw them in the kit. So throw us, throw us the cable in the kit that you recommend. So the Eno B does not. Uh, it might have came like with the trials from a long ways back, but we they, the the actual cables do not come with the Eno B. So if they do come with the Eno B, then that's something the distributor is throwing in. No, I'm suggesting re-kit with. Oh um, well we don't know. I mean that's. We've, we, could, we could, but we don't know the length, right, um, that will be end up desired. We've given, uh, KP will be here, I think, a little bit later. I've kind of given them an earful to start working on low-PIM uh, cables and having that available. So, yes, to answer your question in short, we have talked with KP. To answer your question, sir, is I don't know about you, but every installation is slightly different. At least that's what I've come to find. Typically, I built it up so I could get away with a six-foot cable or less, um, and that is something we could consider, but given the uniqueness of every installation that we all run into, I think creating a one-size-fits-all approach can become problematic, uh, and it'd probably be best just to work with our distributors. And that's to say we couldn't uh, work with those distributors to create a single SKU, so you ordering a part number that comes with the antenna of your choosing, a cable of your choosing and the radio of your choosing, and I'm sure every distributor in here loves to make a buck, so I'm sure they'll make a skew for you. Jeremy, can I get you to draft a um, a blog post on PIM, and then Rick will translate that into a buy tip as well. Sure. Let's yeah. let's get that and get it on the website because it's it's something I only recently learned about myself. Absolutely. Yeah, Cameron, you might we also might want to work with the distributors that are going to sell low PIM cables. Uh, you know, you, you talked about the failure rate if the guys are making them themselves. Mm -hmm. We need to educate the distributors that are going to make it to 
run the tests and make sure that they're going to yeah. pass. Yeah, I mean, and I don't expect everybody in here, I expect distributors probably to have it if they don't, is a PIM tester. PIM testers aren't cheap. I think they're close to 30 grand. So I don't expect all y'all to go out and drop 30 grand. You'd rather drop that on our E node Bs, and so would I. Well, we'll, make sure, we'll make sure that Boone helps get this message out to the partners the importance of this. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, actually, this all came at, as a report from the same time. So in addition to blur i'll usually try to check for the downlink mcs percentages um, so as you can see um, and if you referenced it with that blur report during the spikes you can also see that the downlink mcs is affected and it's actually dropping quite a bit um, this specific customer was having issues of, of customers internet speeds just randomly dropping to be really slow um, which uh, we're believing to be mostly uh, interference related. It could be PIM related, um, but you know these are just metrics to you know check for um, when troubleshooting performance issues. Um, then here's the uplink. So uplink MCS is a little bit more difficult to track just due to the nature of every UE's TX powers going up and down, <laughs> um, but you can kind of you know, view it in a way, you can see that during the downlink MCS drops that the uplink MCS was also dropping at the same time. Um, and one issue you'll find is uh, if it drops heavy enough, then some of the, like we mentioned before, the schedule requests, uh, some of those schedule requests uh, can time out. Um, and then there's timers in LTE, so there could be, you know, low, too low of MC, upload MCS could cause issues where internet just drops for a short period of time. Um, that would be the end user's experience. So this is where, you know, uh, LTE is, uh, doesn't really have any interference mitigation techniques built in to the OFDMA <laughs> yes. standards so that, you know, these, these are things that, you, you know, when planning the RF, PCI planning, and, um, you know, these are all incredibly way more important with LTE than anything else. Um, and then this is uh, the, the last other metric I look for. This is the retransmission count. Um, so here I got the downlink and uplink. And uh, I can see, because actually this customer was experiencing exactly that, that internet would, would almost pause or, or drop. Um, and you can see during the big spikes of retransmit counts, there's a certain max count. If a UE reaches that max count, um, it will actually uh, time out um, and essentially almost reconnect. Um, so anyways, these are metrics that we're going to plan to provide everyone in a more easy way. <laughs> They're available to us through the syslog, but you know you have to parse through it to, to draw this stuff up. Um, so via KPIs, via SNMP, um, and we're also working on a, a parsing program you can uplink files to to generate this stuff. Um, so eventually we'll, we'll offer a more easy way for everyone to view this. <laughs>